several proposals that are um, alternatives to RIDOT's plan and that have been proposed for a central hub in or near Kennedy Plaza and for hubs around the state. I'm Susan Marcus, a member of Rhode Island Transit Riders. We appreciate the opportunity um, to be with you this afternoon to present a short overview of the problems with RIDOT's multi-hub proposal and four options for other ways to handle hubs in Providence and around Rhode Island. This gives us a chance to demonstrate that Rhode Island Transit Riders seeks a constructive conversation about which transit improvements would bring us a substantially better transit system. So may I have the next slide? Let's start with um, a review of Rhode Island Transit Riders' five principles that a bus hub plan must follow. You can read them as well as I can, but I'll just reiterate here. A bus hub must be central. The process of developing these hubs must be transparent. The hub location must serve um, the majority of riders in downtown Providence. The work has to be responsibly financed and the hub must be safe. May I have the next slide. This is a little bit more of a review. Um, seven years ago, in 2014, Rhode Island voters agreed to spend $35 million on transit improvements. The text from the bond is on the screen. It says basically to fund enhancements and renovations to mass, mass transit hub infrastructure throughout the state and to improve access to, multi, uh, in, uh, to multiple intermodal sites, et cetera. May we have the next slide? Um, the Rhode Island uh, Department of Transportation proposes spending the bond money for a multi mini bus hub system. We will start with what the, Rhode, what the RIDOT plan is and why we reject it. And we will go on to cover what we consider to be four better options. One would be for a hub at Dorrance Street. Another would be for a hub at the train station. The third would be to enact this, the Providence's 2017 plan for Kennedy Plaza. And the one that Rhode Island Transit Riders is most fond of, improving Kennedy yeah. Plaza and increasing transit hubs around the state. Okay, so let's get started. Awesome, thank you, Susan. And my name is Liza again, and I'm gonna be introducing the RIDOT multi-hub plan. So the multi-hub plan proposes a set three or four, depending how you look at it, mini hubs, which I like to think of as just like a collection of bus stops. Um, one of them would be somewhere on the edge of the jewelry district, that location continues changing because they can't really seem to find a, a, <laughs> a permanent location where this would work. Um, and, we, and we believe that the kind of the motivation for doing the multi-hub is to really get as many buses out of Kennedy Plaza as possible. So in this, in this plan, that would be um, most of about eight bus berths or stops in the jewelry district. They would um, include passenger amenities like bathrooms and, si and dynamic signage, but it would be built in phases. So if you take a look at the, and I'll drop this link in the chat in a moment, but the RIDOT's actual plan documents, um, it says that it wouldn't, that these things wouldn't be completed until 2024 or 25, I believe. So in Kennedy Plaza, there would be six bus berths on Dorrance and Exchange Streets, um, sort of opposite ends of the plaza. So folks would have to walk through the entire plaza today. Um, Washington Street would um, be cars only in the eastward direction. And Kennedy Plaza would only be used for non-transit uses. And then the train station mini hub would have eight bus berths on exchange and railroad streets, um, new and improved bus and pa rail passenger amenities in the renovated train station. 
So that's the layout for the train station. Sorry, I'm admitting folks as I'm presenting this. So <laughs> sorry, it's a little choppy. Okay. Um, our serious problems with the multi-hub plan. Um, we, as well as many other groups, really don't see too many advantages with this plan, only drawbacks. So, and it's for these reasons. The multiple hubs are gonna cause a lot of confusion and inconvenience um, for, for current riders. RIDOT has sought zero public input in developing or evaluating this proposal. Um, the plan is would have a disproportionate impact on minority, elderly, and low-income riders, as well as those with disabilities, because of the spread-out nature of the far, of having to walk or transfer much more often. And the locational advantages RIDOT claims for this proposal, namely the bringing more bus stops to the train station and the jewelry district, is really silly because it's already provided by the downtown transit corridor that already goes to those locations. Um, the downtown transit corridor was developed and completed last year and already links downtown, the jewelry district and the train station with bu frequent bus service every five minutes. So it really, it, it's like an overlap of that plan and doesn't really make any sense unless you consider how they've been uh, developed for totally separate reasons and as two separate things where downtown transit corridor has been was developed by RIPTA with a public process and the multi-hub has been developed by RIDOT who are highway planners um, without any input from real transit planners or the community members. Okay next we're going to cover the Dorrance Street terminal and I forget who's who's doing this one. Amy. <laughs> Hi, my name is Amy Glidden, and I am with Rhode Island Transit Riders. This slide will be about the Doran Street Terminal. Next slide, please. So this terminal would feature covered indoor waiting areas, um, presumably much more space potentially than the terminal we have now would have a rip to customer service window, bathrooms, and other passenger amenities. It will also have retail and restaurant space along Doran Street, housing above the terminal facility, and public parking as well as parking for building residents and merchants. I think I might have missed a slide, Han. Whoop. Yeah, this one, sorry, so sorry. Yes, uh, <laughs> the location, very important. There we go. Uh, yes, so as you can see, this uh, location for the hub would be right across from the courthouse. So it is very close to the courthouse, which could be a concern for riders. Uh, next slide. Yeah. Okay, so we'll just go back. So this is what it would look like. And now to here. So some of the pros are that um, all the bus lines would stop at the terminal in line with our principle of having all the transfers occur in one place. Oh, it is close to the developing one nine, uh, I 95 area and the waterfront. Uh, the enclosed space is desirable for riders to protect them from the weather. Um, also safer at night. The mixed use of the building would bring more people to the area, increasing a sense of security. There are some cons. It is unclear whether the space is large enough to ensure future expansion of the bus system. It is several blocks away from Kennedy Plaza, presently the center of the city. And the project has not yet received a public hearing. And of course, no proposal should be adopted without public input. Okay, thank you, Amy. Next you. block, yeah, go ahead. Okay, who's taking over for the train station area? This is Patricia. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't realize I had to unmute myself. <laughs> um, I'm presenting the Providence Intermodal Center at the train station area, and I'm Patricia Robb with Rhode Island Transit Riders. Next slide. Um, this, the, the first plan for the train station area was above ground uh, on State House lawn, and that was not popular. 
Uh, so this plan features an underground terminal and it goes where this um, orange uh, oval is beneath the, the east side of the, of the state house lawn. So it's, the state house lawn remains intact. Um, the station is underground. Next. So buses would enter both from the north and then exit, I'm sorry, enter from the south and then exit uh, from the north as you see these circular lines here. Um, they're going from street level down to the below ground concourse level. So we're looking at the below ground um, view of the train station here. And over to the left is the state house. Next. This concourse area or mezzanine view uh, would have a, a passenger hall, uh, including a, a service desk and waiting area, uh, public restrooms, ticketing, and so on. Uh, and the bus lanes and berths are in gray in this particular um, view of it, uh, shown here around the edges of the, um, the, the passenger area. This is the ground level view again. Uh, and now you see that um, it's been uh, re-landscaped. It has some sort of like skylight areas. So it lets a little natural light in um, to the, um, the passenger area below. Uh, the, train, the, the train station is down at the bottom of this picture. Uh, and from the train station, you can see a passageway uh, from the station uh, into the, um, the, the bus terminal. Uh, and then there's another passenger entrance up near the top uh, here, which would be north, uh, which is kind of from um, Smith Street in the, the State House direction. Okay. So there are a lot of uh, what we see as advantages and drawbacks of this particular plan. Uh, again, uh, fitting with our principles, all of the bus lines would stop at the terminal, so it would be a single bus hub. Uh, this, again, simplifies transfers. It's also close to Amtrak and to the commuter rail, so it's good. Um, it's the only plan that really is an intermodal plan, um, connecting, connecting different uh, forms of transportation. Uh, it's an enclosed space again, uh, like the Dorrance Street um, hub. Uh, so in both the winter and the summer, uh, passengers are protected from the weather. Um, it addresses those concerns about the State House lawn by putting the, the terminal underground. Um, this is the only plan that is a, a public-private partnership, which might uh, help to cover the additional cost because this would be the more the most costly of the the options that um, is on the table at this point. But the the idea is that by by building a uh, kind of state of the art terminal um, in this location, that it'll serve uh, as an impetus uh, to attract um, private investment in the state house area, uh, and the the plans show uh, a possible of uh, six additional uh, buildings that could be private uh, buildings and therefore would be bringing in taxes in the area around the state house. And the plan had widespread support when it was first presented, although uh, if it should be considered again, I think it would need uh, to have some more public vetting a second time. Uh, there are some problems with it, though. Uh, from the point of view of today's riders, I think the fact that it's several blocks away from Kennedy Plaza um, and therefore not in the center of the city offsets the fact that it is close to the train station. Um, the roadway system around the train station is already cramped, uh, and it doesn't seem to us that there would be much room for increased uh, bus traffic. And also, we're not sure if the terminal space would be large enough to allow for uh, expansion if the uh, ridership in, um, uh, becomes larger. Uh, we're also not sure that public leaders are that interested in a public 
private pro partnership, uh, which has its own problems to some degree. And the upfront costs are much higher than the other plans, uh, which isn't necessarily um, a, uh, a, a killer drawback, but it, it might be. So that's basically our take on this particular plan. Thanks. I'm Randall Rose. I'm going to talk about another plan which was actually um, put forward and supported by the City of Providence back in 2017 and 2018, um, which would have improved Kennedy Plaza in a lot of ways. So on the next slide, um, it's, um, uh, this is from a presentation on the City of Providence's website. Um, they wanted to imp improve traffic both for buses and other vehicles, um, also improve safety for pedestrians and bicycles, and make better public space. And on the next slide, um, you can see um, there's a picture on the right of the public meeting they had in August 2017. Um, where they asked the, uh, it was completely open to the public and participants were asked, which of these different plans do you like um, and voted on different options. Um, and uh, in fact, the mayor Alorza um, put out a press release, which you can just barely see on the bottom right there. Um, but this is from the city of Providence website, it says mayor Alorza unveils community led vision for Kennedy Plaza. And this, this plan would have actually improved um, the transit situation a whole lot, um, unlike what Rhode Island Department of Transportation, RIDOT, is pushing now, um, which would actually harm transit. This one would actually be better for transit. It was publicly backed, but we haven't heard any uh, peep about it since. Um, so it's, um, it would have been a, um, a lot better than um, what the government is currently proposing. Um, so on the left there, you can see um, this was the result of a public vote. Um, which streets do we want to um, close or keep open? Um, and the vote was 80% for um, making Washington Street transit only, as you'll see on the next slide too. Um, the next slide has on the, on the right there, there's a picture. Um, they wanted to convert Washington Street, the street between the plaza and the park to bus only use. The buses would go in two directions. Um, and um, um, there's diagram. And on the left, you see a picture of where the bus berths would go, these blue bus berths where the buses would stop. Um, so you had um, buses mostly on Washington Street and a few in other parts of the plaza on Exchange Terrace and Fulton Street. Um, so on the next slide here, there were some improvements for bus for pedestrian safety too. Um, in several places around the plaza, they wanted to have um, raised lighted crosswalks, um, raised the intersection um, between um, Exchange Street and Washington Street to make it easier for pedestrians to walk safely because um, it is a pretty busy intersection. You want to make it safer. Um, and on the next slide, there's also a protected bike lane along Exchange Terrace. Um, so um, that connecting to the train station there. Um, and on the next slide, um, the, um, they wanted to eliminate the street that's currently between the skating rink and the park. So between the rink and the park, there's this tiny little street, which is currently for buses only. It's called East Approach. Um, they wanted to get rid of that street, um, have a farmer's market there, have art installation and do some other improvements for public space there um, to um, bring that together. And then on the next slide, um, talking about um, the, yeah, go ahead, um, the pros and cons. There are a lot and some advantages of this. Um, it addressed a number of the concerns that were raised by riders because it went through the public input session. It, it brings all the buses together in one location, um, keeping the optimal location for transit, which is in um, central downtown Providence. That's near a lot of small businesses, near hotels, City Hall and URI. So for a lot of reasons, that's a good location for transit. It's a lot less expensive than the other plans and it redevelops the park in the greater Kennedy Plaza area with ways to improve pedestrian safety. Um, big drawback opposed by nearby commercial landlords. Um, what commercial landlords wanted um, was is to move the buses out of Kennedy Plaza, not what riders want, but that's what the landlords want. Uh, the plans show between seven and nine bus berths, which might be too few, especially if it's only seven. Um, and so you, um, if a plan like this moves forward, you might need to redesign it to allow more bus stops. 
So that's one of the um, plans that um, would be pretty cheap and um, would keep the buses where they are, but also allow a lot of improvements. So that's all the, for my plan. Can I ask you a question I think on your plan? We'll do uh, questions at the end once we have gone. Okay. Thank you, yeah. So I'm Barry Scheller and I'm gonna talk about the fourth option, which is to leave the current footprint of the buses in Kennedy Plaza alone, make some improvements there, and then use the remaining funds for transit hub improvements throughout the state of Rhode Island as both the bond issue promised and as also in the transit master plan. Next. So if we don't move Kennedy Plaza around, that would have uh, the, the lowest cost of what Oh no, Barry, did we lose you? Yeah, he might've got muted. Sorry. Uh, so so uh, the, uh, we, we all know the way Kennedy Plaza is now and leaving the footprint the same is obviously the lowest cost, yeah. which would free up the bond funds, as I said, for uh, implementing what the bond actually uh, called for when the people voted on it. Next. So the, KP improvements might be refreshing the terminal building and actually using the city hall side entrance. Next. Other improvements might be enhanced security, like the call boxes, landscaping, public art, better lighting, information kiosk. And uh, definitely traffic signal improvements to get the buses in and out of the plaza as efficiently as possible. And we could do some of the same protections for pedestrians that were in the third plan. Next. Well, with the leftover funds, the state approved transit master plan calls for regional transit hubs all around the state, like at the plaza, but also at the train station, jewelry district, Pawtucket, Newport, Woonsocket, at the airport, Wickford Junction, and at URI are explicitly mentioned. And beyond that, the transit master plan calls for a network of smaller community mobility hubs, as you can see from the map all over the state. Next. Well, these hubs would have some or all of amenities such as uh, real-time bus information, that's important, but also maps and schedules, wayfaring signs, lighting. Next. So again, pros and cons. Um, the improvements in KP would help perhaps to overcome some of the negative impressions people have about the plaza. And it could be, the whole thing could be accomplished without the disruption of, of uh, construction. Uh, it would also keep the central bus hub where people are used to it, close to all the important things downtown and also has plenty of room for future expansion uh, because there's, I think, still 12 bus hubs. The cons about this plan, well, it may not do enough to change the negative perception that some people have about the plaza. It um, does not allow for one grand space uh, combining the skating rink and the Burnside Park. And of course, there's opposition from the real estate interest, uh, uh, which is inspiring the whole multi-hub in the first place. So uh, at this point, uh, we'll turn it back to Liza, who's the host for this. Oh, I think we have- Oh, a well, yeah, there's more, more pros and cons, sorry. Um, as I said, it would fulfill the bond obligation and uh, what the transit master plan calls for. And um, I think it really has the potential to uh, get statewide public support for RIPTA because we've been investing all over the state. And on the other hand, that could be contentious. So that was, sorry, now it's back to Liza. Okay. So um, now basically we want to answer your questions and have a community discussion um, about, about your thoughts. Um, 
we want to be respectful of folks time it's 5 30 right now um but we're you know i don't have to go anywhere so <laughs> um we're not going to cut you off like the like the planners at the city and the state sometimes do there's not going to be a three minute button but please try to be respectful of other folks time and get your get what you want to say across and we'll try to um answer as best we can so um why don't we do a raise hand thing um and i'll try to call on folks as best i can or just put your hand up in the chat or we'll handle this as best we can um, and i am seeing some um questions in the chat as well so why don't we yeah while i read those let's go first okay um i'm seeing a hand from sherman oh uh, yes good afternoon my name is sherman pines I'm with Rhode Island Organizing Project. When we talk about the changing of Kennedy Plaza or moving Kennedy Plaza, I don't think it's safe for the elderly and disabled. You take an elderly person, they have a routine. Say if they leave Newport coming into Providence, they know that that bus is gonna be there in Kennedy Plaza. They know how to transfer from that bus to another bus to say, go to Rhode Island Hospital, um, go to the grocery stores. And if you take that away from them, somebody's gonna get lost, somebody's gonna get hurt. You take a person who has Alzheimer's, the start of Alzheimer's. They know that that bus is supposed to be there at a certain time. How are they gonna walk either underground now that I mentioned underground, how are they going to walk on the ground? They got wheelchairs, they got walkers. They're not going to be able to handle that. So if you take that portion where Kennedy Plaza is, improve the traffic in there, the sidewalks, the cars coming in and out of there, they're speeding. These people will not be safe. And if you change Kennedy Plaza, you're talking about trouble. There's going to be a lot of trouble with the people. So save Kennedy Plaza and you'll save lives for the elderly and disabled and make them happier. Thank you. Thank you, Sherman. I'm seeing a hand from Torin. Hey, how's it going? Hey. I have a question. I was wondering if there's going to be like a period of time to let everyone know about these changes that would be going to Kennedy Plaza to know that it would be different or if it isn't, you know? I'm wondering what your plans were on that. Does somebody from RITR want to take that? I'm not Are, sure I understand the question. Oh, to I what? can answer the question. Sure. Um, so yeah, we would hope for Kind of what we've tried to do with publicizing the Kennedy Plaza plan to actually, you know, really become active on social media, um, hold events, um, public events that people can come to, can come over from the plaza. Um, I think maybe RIOP might be interested in expanding uh, their postcard project mm -hmm. if, if changes were made. I think we really want to work together with community organizations to have a public information campaign uh, if and when changes to Kennedy Plaza do take place. And I think that is very important for elderly and disabled folks, especially, although the best plan would be one that would not cause them any um, harm. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Yeah, that makes sense though. And like once a direction is decided upon, I guess, by the state, they are required to hold public hearings, which Mm -hmm. we, we would then amplify and make sure community knows about. Oh, I see. All right. You're not going to, they'll, they'll put the public, they'll host the public meetings and just put it on the secretary of state website and do the bare minimum of outreach to make sure people know about it. But we mm -hmm. will make sure to <laughs> amplify those meetings when and if they do happen, um, whether it's RIPTA, the city or, or, or the state, um, whoever is going to take charge. Yeah. Cool. Sounds like you guys got that worked out. I was just curious <laughs> to hear. <laughs> sure. Yeah. No problem. And 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 it's important to note that with the current multi-hub plan, they 
have never held a single public hearing about it. And so they constantly, but they, but they had a construction RFP out. So that was, and they kept saying, you know, we don't know the impacts yet. So, and, but because we haven't held and we haven't done the analysis because we haven't mm -hmm. had a public hearing, it hasn't been through the process, but at the same time, they were putting out a construction RFP. So that's highly incongruous. And that's why the yeah. association of planners came out and said, this is a breach of ethical planning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and that's a big part of what uh, the major problems with that plan is, um, mm -hmm. is the total negation of, uh, of an ethical um, planning process. Yeah, I mean, when you don't tell anyone about it, I mean, people yeah. are going to be upset. <laughs> right. I see. You. But thank okay. you. Thank you. Um, okay, next up, we've got Juanita Gibson from CLF. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you again for the presentations. I really appreciate it seeing it again. Um, yeah, and I, I'm from Conservation Law Foundation and their Environmental Justice Program. And my question is, do, do folks have more insight in terms of the third plan and the fact that it was so community or public led and there was so much engagement, why that kind of disappeared or, or like what was the, why did that kind of fade to the background in terms of like it's, um, I guess, eligibility as a plan and then also if folks have more to say about the lack of public engagement from RIDOT. I just kind of want to dig deeper into that, I suppose, and, and get a better understanding of, of why that's happening. Um, well, I, I would say that, first of all, that RIDOT doesn't really have a mechanism for public engagement the way, for example, RIPTA does. RIPTA has open board meetings with public comment. When they make a change, they have hearings all over the state in every county, actually. Um, RIDOT doesn't have that mechanism. And the limited thing that they used to do with quarterly roundtables, the current administration canceled that. That was coordinated by the Environment Council of Rhode Island. But the current administration, when uh, Governor Raimondo took over, canceled that. And there's nothing in the, in the normal process of RIDOT to, to, to have public input. Um, one of the it's a historical accident that in 2014, I, I, um, the original concept uh, had been, I believe, to have a public-private partnership at the train station building over the tracks. And that, because RIDOT has the responsibility for rail-related transit in Rhode Island, a decision made back in the 70s, um, they were given the, the jurisdiction over the bond issue. Turned out it wasn't practical to build over the train tracks and that's, but nevertheless, RIDOT still has the, um, the uh, we're still given the authority. So um, one of the things we've been asking for is that responsibility for the bonds be shifted in its implementation to RIPTA that has obviously way more expertise at running, a, uh, designing and running a bus hub. I'll also say um, that um, actually Liza put this in the chat, but one uh, reason why the, um, City of Providence's 2017 plan was stopped was um, because the um, a group of downtown property owners um, led by Joe Paolino um, sued over it. So that was part of the reason. Um, but it is true, RIDOT historically has not, um, has not cared about setting up opportunities for public input. They could if they wanted to, they just don't. So. Okay. I'm seeing a hand from Bobby. Might want to unmute. Yeah, Bobby, can you unmute? Yes. Oh, hi. Um, I'm questioning uh, what's happening with the suit that the transit um, organization and SPNA has against uh, right out on this issue. And why was over a million dollars spent redesigning Providence uh, uh, Kennedy Plaza by some English company who knows nothing about Providence. Um, I believe I saw Dwayne Keys enter. Mm -hmm. Dwayne, do you want to give an update on the Title VI suit? Actually, can we come back to that? I'm kind of multitasking with this meeting. So if you can give me a few minutes and I can get back to that answer. 
Sure. Right, let me, let me just, just jump in. Um, so you're talking about the English company Arup, um, which the city of Providence hired for um, to sketch a redesign of Kennedy Plaza and they come up, came up with a super expensive plan. Um, I think, um, and I'm just um, saying my impression here, don't know for sure, but my impression is they really wanted to sell the public on this idea that um, getting rid of the bus hub in Kennedy Plaza would somehow um, be great for social justice, for equity, for the environment and so on. Um, even though it's harmful, especially to um, people of color and the disabled, it's harmful to um, the environment because it makes the bus system harder to use and the bus system is really good for the environment. Um, they wanted to make it all sound good and they um, came up with a story that if you spend over a hundred million dollars, which they don't have, um, then you will have this wonderful, attractive, um, touristy place um, downtown. Um, and it's, it's, uh, this is the kind of thing we've seen. The reason why I think that that's what they're trying to do is that's what we've seen so many times before. Um, Kennedy Plaza was shut down for construction in 2014 to 2015. Again, there was there were these glossy pictures in the media about how great Kennedy Plaza would be afterwards. And um, when the construction was done, Kennedy Plaza wasn't any better. In some ways, it was worse. Um, in some ways, maybe a little better, um, but wasn't any better. It was just um, less bus berths. So they keep doing this. They keep saying, we're gonna make Kennedy Plaza this wonderful place um, with, um, with fewer buses and it's an excuse to get rid of the buses, but they never have the money to make anything um, much better there. Thank you, Randall. Um, yeah, yeah, Amy's saying the cost to design Arab's plan was 1.8 million, but the actual, it would be, it would cost $140 million to implement fully, um, which we don't think they have to do. Um, I saw Mal's hand next. Thanks, yeah. Um, just as a follow up to Randall's point about how the claim is that the multi-hub proposal from RIDOT would be better for the environment um, but none of the pros or cons to my knowledge for any of the plans included um, any type of like analysis of like how many riders could potentially be increased or, you know, what the impact on ridership would be. And I'm interested in that because the state is now legally obligated to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 and transportation is the largest source of that. And so you can't really meet the 2030 goal by tying your hand behind your back and making transit worse. Like, you know, we need fewer cars on the road and improving transit is a major strategy to do that. So I'm wondering if there's any sense of um, how the plans would fare on that front. And I know like broadly, I trust people's experiences. And, you know, when people say it'll be easier to use or harder to use, I think that's a good like proxy, but having clear evidence that our climate goals would be harder to meet, I think would let an organization like Green Energy Consumers, where I work, kind of hit it from that angle. Um, so curious if folks have thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I can say a little about that. Um, from what I, you know, from what I've heard, I, I do know that um, the, the state government does not think in the rational way you've been describing. Um, they, do not, they do not say, we, they do say we have um, a, a goal, a requirement to improve um, greenhouse gas emissions this much by 2030. What you will never see them do is um, thinking, okay, what role does transit play in that plan? You, um, that, that is not done in any serious way. Nobody goes to RIPTA and says, um, what, um, how can you help us? How can, nobody in state government goes to RIPTA and says, how can you help us meet our climate goals? Um, RIPTA is not allowed to go to state government and say, um, we can help you re reach our climate goals. If, um, we can have this much effect for, that, for spending this much money. Um, there is no serious exploration of that at all. It's just the politicians want to say we are going to um, reach this greenhouse gas emissions target and they will 
will never um, talk about using transit to do that because there is no rational planning process. It's just a case of them trying to sound good um, and they are not going to think about actually um, helping transit because tran bus transit is stereotyped in the minds of a lot of state leaders. It's stereotyped as something um, for people with no clout, um, for um, something that's just a cost center and not a center to, to for um, gaining um, um, improvements in greenhouse goals or anything else. It's just a cost center, something that they tolerate and um, can squeeze money from when they can um, and use it as an excuse to get federal funding. Um, because there's federal, so it's, it's not taken seriously. Okay, um, Dwayne, just let me know that he's available to answer the previous question about the Title VI civil rights lawsuit. Yeah. Great, so I'm not sure if anyone wanted an update or what was the results. I mean, I can answer what the question was. Essentially, uh, we did share this um, as best as we could of everyone. Um, we sent, uh, it was basically the same complaint, but both to RIDOT and to Ripta, so both of them were served. Um, in this process, RIDOT responded first, uh, myself and John, who wrote SMART, who was the co-filer, both had two separate meetings with the Title VI coordinator at RIDOT um, to elaborate more on our concerns um, and to share what we thought were the things that RIDOT should do to respond. And obviously we were talking about they need to incorporate a full community engagement process. Um, we need to make sure that they do an impact assessment. It, it wasn't just, if we do this, this is what we're trying to do. It's like, if we do A, what will happen in terms of C, B, C, and D versus X, you know, you know blah, blah. So um, RIPTA also responded in terms of a quick meeting. Um, but they, as they were kind of the secondary partner in this, they did not respond on their own. So we never got an actual response from RIPTA on this, um, as they were not the lead on this particular project, Ride Up was. Um, obviously, for those who know, it took 25 days beyond the initial 60 days that Ride Up was to do to respond, to actually respond. Liza did put the link in the chat in terms of the actual response. To sum it up, their answer was it was too soon to tell if this proposed plan would be discriminatory or create a disparate impact on those who use it. So we've interpreted as what they're saying is, well, it actually hasn't happened. So we can't say that it actually will happen until it actually does happen. And in a way, we should wait until it actually does happen to then file a complaint. But then as we know, by that time, it would have already been done. And if there is any correction, it would take it was so much more to do. Um, so that was the response. Um, at this point, John and I had discussed, do we go further in terms of the next steps, do we go to federal level since we can obviously get the response on the state level. But what we did was we waited until we saw what the outcomes were when it came to the proposed budget. Because remember everyone at well, the then proposed budget, now the past budget in the General Assembly. Because the next step was, can we get at least the General Assembly to not to provide the funding for this project to move forward? And that's exactly what did happen. The General Assembly in terms of House Finance Committee took that funding item for this project out of the budget. So for at least the next year, it has no money to move forward with it. That's, that's, that's the issue with it. Um, and I do see that someone says you got statute of limitations. We are very much aware of that option. So thank you so very much, Jeremy. With that, we're weighing in all these particular options as to what we should do. Um, but that's not all from going higher. Um, and at the same time, we are sort of, I don't want to stay giving the benefit of the doubt, but Ride that did say they would do an engagement. Liza, to your point, we've been waiting. Uh, it hasn't happened. So um, at this point, we have not said yes or no. It's not hold. We haven't left it alone. We're watching, we're observing, we're reviewing, we're monitoring, we're getting feedback from you, we're seeing what's happening. But that option of going higher is still there. Okay, thank you so much, Dwayne. Um... Let's uh, hear from Wendy next. Hello. As of one of the several people that were out doing the Pacoose Pie campaign, we talked to probably 600 people, got 500 postcards uh, signed, 
and a lot of comments on those post cards. And there were maybe a couple that wanted it to get changed, but most people didn't want. But also as a rider, the last time they worked on closed out, they closed down the terminal and was doing work on the terminal. I was out there on weekends and stuff and helping people find their bus stops because they couldn't find them. And this isn't, we're not talking just handicapped and seniors, we're talking families. We're talking people with kids. We're talking people that have to take their kids to school. We have to talk into people that are going to work, you name it. So it, this doesn't affect, this affects absolutely everybody that rides these buses. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you, Wendy. Wendy and Ray from the Rhode Island Organizing Project have been out in Kennedy Plaza for weeks, months, talking to, yeah, 600 riders they've, they've talked to and, and had those, a lot of those riders um, sign postcards and mail them to the governor's office. So they're really doing the outreach <laughs> that RIDOT should be doing. That is, the, that is the model. And we thank you so much for your allyship on this issue. Um, okay, and now we get to hear from Marjorie of the, of the organizing project as well. Hi, um, I, I have to, Wendy probably said it before I did, and that's to kind of bring it back to the human cost of moving these buses around. You know, Kennedy Plaza has been essential. Can it be improved? I absolutely would like money spent on improvement of Kennedy Plaza. The, the timing okay. for, the, for the crossings need to change. You know, they're, they're far too quick. You know, I, you know I, I have to practically run across, you know, so the way the cars are allowed to come in and out. There's lots of things that can be done to improve Kennedy Plaza without dismantling it. You know, the other issue is that concerns me as a driver is, is having any type of terminal up where the train station is. There is enough traffic and congestion there now without added adding buses and people waiting for buses to that equation. I frankly don't see, um, I've seen lots of the, the, the solutions, but I don't see any real solution to how you're gonna address the automobile traffic that's also part of that scenario. So when Wendy says it's gonna affect any, everybody who rides the buses, it's going to affect anybody who drives in the area as well. So I think that that people, you know, people sometimes respond, I don't take the bus. Well, do you drive anywhere downtown? Then you need to consider and you need to find out what's going on. So it's really, you know, we're talking about the movement of people efficiently from one place to another. And I don't see, see the current plan that's being offered as doing that. All it's doing is trying to empty out Kennedy Plaza and we know it's not only the buses, it's the people they want to get rid of. So, you know, we, we have to be real about what the motivations are behind this plan. And that is to move people out of Kennedy Plaza and so that they can develop it economically. And that's, you know, is, is a huge part of what's going on here. And I don't think it's being talked about enough. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marjorie. Um, next, we're gonna hear from Jeremy. Um, I'm not sure what you're referring to as the transitions team, the governor's transitions team. Yeah, that's what I was um, referring to as the governor's transition team. It seems like everybody's using this, these, this group of uh, elected transition members to kind of weigh in on public uh, consensus in regards to what or where uh, certain funds are being allocated, find uh, I guess specific leaders in this transition team as a way to leverage public meeting. And I think it's very dangerous. Um, you know, especially some of these organizations don't even have their you know, finger on, um, you know, the pulse of maybe five or 10 people. So how could they be, you know, acted as transition members or representing a minority or, or a group of individuals, you know? And so I think we should watch that, um, that, that tactic. Um, 
because it's happening a lot here. They had $42 million already allocated out of the uh, generalist or the city council's uh, fund that was supposed to you know, be for COVID relief. So there's money that is being uh, maneuvered here. And I think that we need to keep a closer eye on this because I, I didn't know about the $1.8 million plan. Um, is, that, is, there, is that cited somewhere that they actually spent that money? on a field plan? Um, is, is there anything? Yeah, definitely. That is there any proof to that? Because I think it's kind of dangerous that, we, that we're being like played like pawns and we have like these six elected transition team members. I don't know how long they're going to be there, um, but we don't need them to be speaking for the, you know, if it's 600, 1200 or 1800, um, you know, public transit, uh, passengers i don't think that they have the right to be able to speak on on on, on behalf of the, that community at all um sorry i'm not sure what you're referring to the transition team again like our... yeah the transition team that was what was selected by the governor to help him in uh if you want to say allocating specific uh dollars in regards to his transition going into the office and also how he could try to create an inclusive and diverse um, uh, stable government and um, an equity in the urban area. So there was some people that he selected as transition team members. Yeah, yeah. So one of our and one of our allies, John Flaherty, um, who from Grow Smart, who filed the Title VI complaint is on that transition team. To my, to our knowledge, they've sort of just been an advisory role and haven't had a lot of <laughs> um, power or input in what's been happening. But um, in regards to this specific issue, maybe in other issues that certain members have had more power, I'm not sure. No, that was it. I was just wondering, you know, if, the, if, if this information that you guys were bringing forward, if it was cited like anywhere that I could like actually research this like microfield, you know, whatever, find this information in regards to this, um, to this fund that is being utilized. I can send I to you the, the information about the ARA plan. Um, but the, what, from what I understand that money came out of the city's capital improvement program. Um, that's, that's what I understand. Hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Zan. Hey, thanks so much, everybody. Um, I have also been, um, I just wanted to add to Wendy's comment. I've been out there doing some postcarding as well this summer. And I, um, I think one of the, the main things, so we have the po on the postcards, there's often like, sometimes it feels a little bit more transactional or just like, getting them to fill out their name and sort of sign the petition. Sometimes there's a conversation. Um, the, a lot of the um, messages that, we've, that people have written on the card, um, we have a lot of messages of people with disabilities and just feeling unsafe already, kind of crossing the, the streets and then like getting to their stops if the, the hubs are sp split up around town. So. I guess I'm just putting in my vote for that, the plan that would involve the improvement to pedestrian safety, um, particularly for that demographic of riders. Um, and yeah, I'm also wondering about the, it seems to me like the 2017 plan and then the plan that also improves transit throughout the whole state, those two plans are like, could possibly be sort of the same since the it'll already cost less to do the 2017 plan is that is that an accurate interpretation of that yeah yeah i think it is um basically the fourth idea kind of incorporates this the city's 2017 plan with and adds in um the the proposals for mini hubs throughout the state that were developed as part of the transit master plan um which also and both of those had some public input well, actually, it wouldn't be the the entire um, 2017 proposal. We're suggesting just making some some fairly minor um, adjustments, uh, which came out of the two seven, 2017. 2017 also included um, kind of uh, reorganization of the park area, 
as well as the transportation area. Um, if we did the entire 2017 plan, we wouldn't have any money left. Uh, so this was kind of 2017 light. <laughs> Thank you, Patricia. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that for me too. <laughs> um, Sam Corin. Hi, yeah, I might've missed this and I'm sorry if it's redundant to ask, but um, did, did RIDAT, has, has RIDAT specified when they would begin construction assuming that um, their plan goes forward? Uh, I think that's a big question mark right now. Um, they, uh -huh. <laughs> anybody else want to answer that? As far as I understand, they can't do construction without holding any public hearings. And they said they were going to hold public hearings in April and then again in August maybe. And now that hasn't happened. So I think if they were, it would be at the earliest next year. Like they've missed this, this construction season for sure. But does anybody else want to take that? Cool, thank you. I don't think anybody really knows the answer. Yeah. <laughs> Dwayne, yeah. Liza, I just said in the chat, like I think the real maybe a strategy for the uh, run on transit riders and for the you know resilience coalition is to really tr try to get the administration to confirm whether they are or are not. Because I think the reality is, unless they confirm that, we have to remain on full alert. We have to navigate this uncertainty. We have to keep these plans on here. And we're going to continue to say, you know, oh, we we don't know. We don't know, which is why we have to continue to have these conversations and move forward. Unless we get full confirmation in writing that they will not move forward, that they discard this plan, or they're going to start all over all the things that we've said, all the things that we've asked for, until they confirm that we pretty much are going to have to navigate in this uncertainty and just be on full alert that, and, and proceed as if they will be doing it um, until they otherwise confirm and we are all comfortable saying, well, yes, we can move on to the next issue. But I think that's really why we're stuck in a situation while we still should do what we're doing with selecting and proposing our own plan, doing those things. So then at least that, that eliminates the option to say that there was no alternative. I, I agree with Twain. I think that we need to stay on alert. But I also think the second part of Twain's comment, I think the governor at this point is looking for uh, what plan would the public get behind? And so if we have a plan that we prefer, I think we need to start talking about it. It, it might also be worth mentioning if I I haven't put up my hand, but can I, can I speak? Yeah, go ahead. Um, it might also be worth mentioning that the bond funds have been dwindled down from $35 million to $20 million, we think. And those bond funds, the, the remaining $20,000 have to be committed before November or the, um, the seven year date that they have before they expire, expires. So the governor is under considerable pressure, we think, to come up with some way to issue new bonds against that 20, the remaining $20 million. So this would be a very good time to coalesce around the plan um, that he thinks uh, that we could get his support for um, and that could move forward for bonding in November. Thank you. Yes, pressure's on. Um, Steve Alquist, you have something to, to add? And thank you so much for covering this issue so thoroughly for so long. Uh, no problem. Uh, I was at the governor's press conference today and I asked him specifically about this subject. And what he said was that he's been meeting with people. He said he met with the Ripper Riders at some point. He said he met with the Providence Partnership, which I'm not sure what he meant exactly by that, but he said, I believe, and I'm not sure what the Providence Partnership exactly is, what he was talking about. But he said he met with them yesterday and that they are interested in this as well. Um, he said that he wants to get everybody to come together. Um, he wants to force everybody together if they don't get together on the plan. And that um, he said he's, that's where he's at right now, but he definitely wants to bond the money before November 1st. And he wants some sort of plan before November 1st. 
he did not recommit to having any kind of public presentations or public uh, meetings or anything. So I'm not sure exactly where he stands. I'm still trying to figure out exactly what a statement means, but I did put the video up on this Facebook so people can watch it and see what he said. Thank you. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yep. And I just want to call out that I'm hearing in the chat that people support. Um, well, we could also we could also say that the Providence he met with the Providence Foundation, right? Don't we know that? I don't know. I don't know if that's what we met with and yesterday. Other, he met with the Providence Foundation and a few other people. Yes, yesterday. <laughs> I think that uh, people like me that want to see Kennedy Plaza improve but in its current footprint uh, and then using the rest of the money for other bus hubs around the state, including including in Pawtucket, Woonsocket, North Kingstown and other places, uh, that, that uh, one thing we have going for us is that the Bright Eye plan has had a difficulty pulling things together. Their original Dyer Street plan doesn't seem to be working out. They don't have the money to do the train station. I'm not sure they have the money to do Doran Street. So it's possible, it's possible that we could actually succeed in pushing over improving Kennedy Plaza and, and bus hubs around the state because I don't think that they have a coherent alternative to that within their budget. And uh, I, I mean, I could be wrong about that, but it does seem like if they had a, a plan that they were behind, they would they would have already started on it, uh, and they're running out of time. And I think we have an opportunity if we could stay together and have a, a, a clear message that we want to spend the money to improve transit in Kennedy Plaza and around the state. That we might succeed. Awesome. Ed, Ed Source, did I see your hand go up? I'm not sure. Oh uh, yeah, I want to speak. I I rather see Kenny Plaza stay as it is and just improve it, and I also hire more security guards to keep it more safe for everybody. Awesome. Thank so. you. Yeah, I think a lot of us are feeling that way. Thank you. And I'm also uh, still part of member of. Around transit writers, and I'm also a member of ATEC uh, committee. Yes, thank you so much for being here. No problem. Awesome. Okay. Next. Yeah. Who put those hands up if you have uh, thoughts on the four plans or moving forward, or this is time to speak? Uh, Sherman? My thought is about the students, college students, high school students. Mm -hmm. They catch the bus into Kennedy Plaza, transfer to go over to their schools. A lot of young people come into Kennedy Plaza. They know Kennedy Plaza. If you improve Kennedy Plaza, it's going to cost millions of dollars to move Kennedy Plaza, meaning mm -hmm. move the bus hubs away from Kennedy Plaza. But what you need to do is just re redo it, redo that area, redo it to slow down these cars. And Marjorie Waters said, when you're crossing the street, I catch the bus into Providence. And I have crossed the street to go to that bank. By the time I got into the middle of the intersection, cars was flying at me because the lights are too short. Right. So you're looking at um, the traffic being slowed down. You're looking at repairing that part of the road. You're looking at students that is catching the bus at Kennedy Plaza. So if you change it, if you do the underground hub, if you do the railroad station hub, these people are not going to be in there. They're going to be lost. Thank you. Thank you so much for those comments. Um, Bobby, are, is your hand 
up for another comment or from the last one? I'm not sure. Yes, I'm, I'm concerned that we're dealing not only with Paolino and a handful of downtown property owners, I mean, which we could put on one hand, but possibly a, a government, uh, Rhode Island government agency that has uh, some possible corruption involved because they move around a corrupt political widgets. Um, one move from Rhode Island College to the convention center and now to Ripta. So what, what are we up against? We're up against a Rhode Island that will never go forward because of, if you know a guy, you're gonna get a job. Get a job. I'm just disgusted with it after living in this state for over 50 years. Yeah, agreed. It's really disheartening. And I think, and we, we hope and think that if we can come coalesce around, around an alternative and, and show that there's widespread support for it, perhaps we can transcend that old way of doing things. Perhaps. <laughs> um, Rui, I saw your hand up for a second. We'd love to offer you the floor if you're, if you want to speak. Rui? Well, I think, uh, I think the other the way to engage this is uh, see with the other potential candidates like uh, Secretary of State Gorbea uh, happen to think ab about this issue. Um, it gives them an opportunity to opine on uh, on something that they may be inheriting sooner rather than later. Yeah, that's a great idea, and we can. I think the Rhode Island Transit Riders certainly can do some kind of, you know, que candidate questionnaire um, and mobility. I think that's something Streets Coalition is interested in doing um, maybe sooner rather than later um, for all the for all the candidates for office. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Jeremy, did you have another comment? No, actually, I was just saying that that was a great idea that you should, that, that needs to happen ASAP, especially yeah. if they're going to postpone this uh, money or money being spent after November 1st. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, it's just about 6.15. That's when we had planned to, um, to, stop. I just want to make sure that everyone's had an opportunity to speak if they want to. Um, it sounds like the option four is the one that we're all gravitating towards. Oh, Ray. Ray Gagne. And I mean, just one thing to add about the outreach that RIAP does. I think there's also strong support throughout the state to invest in, you know, throughout the state. Marjorie in particular works in subsidized housing all over the state. We have folks on the call from Newport. So I think plan four is good, A, because it's got the support of the riders in Kennedy Plaza, but I think it would have the support of people throughout the state who need, who need transit investments. Great, thanks. Thanks so much. Thanks yeah. for all your work with Thank you. all the outreach. Okay, um, Kathleen Gannon. Hi, I'm Kathleen Gannon from the Rhode Island Bicycle Coalition. Uh, firstly, I just want to thank the transit riders for all their leadership and their hard work and focus on this issue because it's vitally important. And as people have outlined, um, a lot of forces have aligned um, on one side of the issue. And so you've been a really wonderful counterbalance uh, to the, those forces and um, you raised the profile of the issue and kept it in front of everyone's mind. And I truly, truly appreciate it. And so I also just want to put in the plug for complete streets, all road users, cyclists, as well as pedestrians, vulnerable road users, such as um, people in wheelchairs and scooters, and everyone should be welcome in Kennedy Plaza. Everyone should be welcome at the bus hub, um, multimodal transportation. I mean, one great thing about Ripka is that they do have bike racks on every single bus across the system. And so um, that really does expand the range for cyclists uh, across the state. And so we need a space there as well. And um, I'm, I know you're not gonna forget us. And I just, 
again, really want to thank you for all the work that you've done. Thank you, Kathleen. Yeah, I think um, making bicycle storage a part of any bus hub is a secure bicycle storage and safe routes to get to getting there is a big part of whatever happens next. <laughs> You're here. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, okay, let me um, uplift what Marjorie saying in the chat um, to call, email, or tweet the governor and express your support of plan four. Improve KP and establish improved hubs outside the Providence metro area. So, and Sam asked, how do we reference or link to plan four when contacting the governor? That's great. Um, we're, I think the Rhode Island transit riders need to develop some communications materials around this plan <laughs> um, to, to help um, with the advocacy over from now until November 1st. Um, but, so if, but even before we do that, um, I, uh, if you just want the key idea plan for summarized in one sentence, um, the idea is don't break up the hub in Kennedy Plaza, keep it there, but add more hubs throughout the state. We still got one at Warwick Mall. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Well, I, I want to say thank you to Liza. I have to. I have to go uh, for hosting. And um, as a longtime transit writer myself, I I appreciate everybody taking their time to uh, on this call to try to make sure that the right thing is done. Uh, for, for transit and transit users. Thank you. Um, I, I want to say, I want to give a thank you. He hasn't participated in the meeting, but I'm just so grateful that Nick uh, de Cristoforo from the ATU is here. Um, I think the, tra the transit workers have supported the system through the pandemic and taken a lot of risk in doing their jobs every single day. And uh, I'm just grateful to you and the union um, for, for being there for us um, and taking it, getting us where we need to go. So thank you for being here. Thank you for your work throughout the pandemic. And we hope to um, you know, continue the partnership between the riders and the drivers. I'd like to know. Yeah. You. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'd like to thank all of you for doing what you do. We are here and I think we are on the right track with Kennedy Plaza. I believe in you, and I'll be reaching out to you all Thank very you. shortly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I just want to give a shout out to everyone um, for helping organize this on social media. We couldn't have made this happen without all of our partner groups um, helping to spread the word and spread awareness. And I know some of you were reaching out on the ground as well. So thank you to everyone. We appreciate all your support. And you know, if we work together, we can defeat the multi-hub plan and come up with a Kennedy Plaza that works better for everyone and spreads the resources around the state. Thank you. Um, we've recorded this meeting um, and I'm gonna save the chat. So if anybody wants the link or we'll, we'll put out an email to everybody um, on, our, on our email list, follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Rhode Island Transit Riders, or I'm going to just drop my email in the chat once more. And you can use that to get connected to any of our different communications channels. Okay, thank you so much. We're only five minutes over, that's wild. <laughs> thank you for your time. Thank you, for, yeah, thank you so much. I'm gonna stop recording. <laughs>